My name's Arthur, and I'm 21 years old. Last year, I got into the university to study architecture. Since my parents made a decent living and I was the only child, they asked me if I wanted to rent an apartment. Of course! It's a lot better than sharing a room with someone, I said. Yes, but we've checked out the prices in the area. You'll have to share the flat with someone else, my father explained. Well, still a better alternative. As long as I find a person with whom I get along and we establish a few basic ground rules, I think it'll be fine, I said. And so, it was settled. After a month, I met a guy named Brian. He was from my university, but was studying something else related to ancient history and religions. I have to admit, it's not something that fascinates me that much, although I know it's a field that is becoming more and more popular, even in mainstream and social media. Brian was cool. Very peaceful, but always up for a good conversation. He smiled often and had an optimistic and easygoing character. Sometimes we spoke about what he liked, other times about my own preferences. We discussed a lot of things, music, movies, whatnot. We didn't have a lot in common, but it didn't matter to me. I felt comfortable around Brian, and we were simply sharing a flat. The two of us scanned for apartments relatively close to the university, and eventually found a flat that was excellent. Two bedrooms, one bathroom, the kitchen, and one decent living room. The kitchen wasn't too big, but the rest was perfectly fine. The price was also very appealing. During the first couple of weeks, everything was normal. Let's put it that way. Me and Brian had our own routines and schedules. Sometimes we'd eat together and watch a movie in the living room, but now and then we wouldn't even meet. We also had different friends. So every time Brian, or me, wanted to have some people over, we'd discuss that. Okay, so tomorrow you're going to have your friends over. It's a deal. I'll stay clear from the living room and the kitchen as well. I'll just eat something outside, I said to Brian, the first time he asked if he could invite his friends. Arthur, you're very welcome to join us. Maybe you'll find it interesting. In any case, for sure you can use the kitchen. No ceremonies, no problems. It's up to you, Brian said. Well, I will say hello at least, since I'll be back home to sleep. I can't make it too late. I actually have to work on an assignment. I'm glad our bedrooms are big enough. They're perfect to study and to sleep. I wish I had a girlfriend too, eh? I said, trying to be funny. Oh, Arthur, there are so many more things to discover that'll bring you happiness. Girlfriends are basically mundane things. That's just something to keep you away from the real truth and meaning of life. Brian's answer was mysterious. And the first time I found him enigmatic, to say the least. If you say so, Brian. I'm sorry. But as you know, philosophy and religion aren't exactly my cup of tea. Yeah, I'm aware that's your thing, and we can talk about that sometime, but not right now, I replied. Of course. Maybe later, then. See you, Arthur. Take care, Brian. Have a good time. And so we departed, as this conversation took place in a coffee shop near our university. Following my own advice, I had dinner in an Italian restaurant and took my time before returning home. I was hoping that Brian's friends would be gone by then. But that wasn't the case. It was almost midnight when I returned to my flat, our flat, and Brian's gathering was still happening in the living room. Now, besides Brian, there were two other individuals with him. One of them was clearly in his late 50s, and the other one was an old woman way beyond 50. I was freaked out because Brian and his two weird friends were dressed in even weirder clothes. Pink robes and also pink hats, like those of monks. But even more bizarre was the fact that they had a pink spot on their foreheads, made with some kind of cheap ink. Still, I tried to be polite. Um, hello everyone, good evening, I greeted as I entered the living room. Ah, oh, Arthur, hello! Please meet my friends Markon and Lucy. Brian said as I shook everyone's hands. Uh, nice to meet you both, I replied. I'm sure you're feeling awkward because of our clothes. I'll explain. Through our research, we have discovered what we call the third way of life. You know, Arthur, every person has a spiritual third eye right here inside our foreheads. This is why we painted ourselves. And the third eye is what allows us to see the reality as it is beyond the dream and the illusion that are our normal lives. We want to find truth and cosmic liberation. Why don't you have a seat, Arthur? We can also set you free. 
Brian said. Uh, not really. I'm, I'm off to bed. I'm very sleepy. Maybe another time, I replied, feeling very uncomfortable. Okay, Arthur. Sleep tight. You too, Brian. Nice to meet you, uh, Macron and Lucy. I departed. I was, in fact, very tired, so I didn't have much time to think about all that. There are all sorts of religions these days. The internet and mass media has made everything and everyone look normal, I guess. So I decided not to worry about Brian's third way of life shit. As I fell asleep, I had, however, a disturbing dream. Brian was shooting his two friends, Macron and Lucy, in their foreheads using a gun. And then he came to my bedroom and did the same to me. I woke up in a panic. Ugh, damn nightmare, I said to myself. Yes, life is a nightmare. But I'm here to set you free, my friend, said Brian. He was there, inside my bedroom, with a gun pointed at my forehead. Brian, don't do anything stupid, please, I pleaded. It's not stupid, my friend. Stupid is to live the lie. I'll set you free, and then I'll do the same with me. Macron and Lucy are already in the real world. I threw my pillow against Brian's gun, which was enough to distract him. I ran away from my bedroom and from the apartment. I was still able to hear a gunshot, and Brian screaming for my name. But fear made me run faster. I went directly to the police and reported the situation. When the police arrived, they saw Macron and Lucy dead. They were shot precisely in their foreheads. As for Brian, he took his own life through the same process. This was my traumatizing experience with my crazy flatmate, Brian. I moved out of that house because of recurring nightmares and trauma. I took a part-time job to distract myself and shifted to a smaller, one-bedroom apartment. But sometimes I still have nightmares about Brian. He calls for me to join him and his friends. They appear far, but at peace. I have no idea how to get rid of these crazy, stupid dreams. My flatmate had always been strange. It was hard to put into words, uh, other than she was unpredictable. You would never quite gauge what direction her mood would go in, or how she would react to anything you said. But then, one day, it was like something inside her just snapped. Whatever monster was lingering inside her finally decided to show itself. It was a dismal morning. Rain pattered dully against the windows, the sky overcast and gray, casting a shadow over everything. I was up late, since I had no lectures that morning, and snoozed my alarm, and the flat was unusually quiet. All I could hear was the soft plip of rain dripping from the gutters, and the distant rumble of cars over wet tarmac. Stifling a yawn, I climbed out of bed and headed into the kitchen, desperate for some coffee. I didn't see her standing there until I already had the coffee pot in hand, about to pour it into my usual mug. She must have crept up behind me while I was distracted, tiptoeing in her socked feet, because I barely heard a squeak out of her until she whispered my name, her hot breath falling against my neck. I jumped, hot coffee spilling over my hand and dripping onto the floor as I turned to face her. April, what the hell? I blurted my cheeks flushing with a mixture of embarrassment and anger. She barked out a laugh. <laughs> Pour me a cup, too, was all she said, before sidling away, her red ponytail swinging over her shoulder. I shook my head in exasperation, grabbing some kitchen towels to mop up the mess. Half the things she did rarely made sense to me, but she always paid the rent on time, and it would be difficult finding another flat in the middle of the city if I left this one. I had to work with what I had, which meant putting up with her strange antics every once in a while. Pulling another cup out of the cabinet, I poured out two steaming mugs of coffee, adding cream and sugar to my own and leaving April's black how she liked it. Ah, perfectly bitter, she said as she took a sip, cradling the hot ceramic against her palm. Mm, I muttered, 
carrying mine back to my room so that I didn't have to deal with her before I was fully awake. I ended up leaving the flat an hour before my lecture started, with the excuse that I needed to visit the library. In reality, I just wasn't in the mood to deal with my odd flatmate. April wasn't in when I got home later that evening. It was autumn, which meant dusk fell earlier than usual, and the flat was full of shadows. I switched on the hallway light and shrugged out of my coat and shoes, calling out for my flatmate and receiving no response. Hmm, maybe she'd gone out somewhere. Making sure the door was locked behind me, I went to the kitchen to fill a glass with water, then carried it to my room, sitting down at my desk to go over my notes for the day. As I was poring over my notebook, I heard the floorboards creak behind me, and a cold feeling enveloped my chest as I glanced over my shoulder. I was alone in the room, but the door to my closet was partially ajar. Had it always been like this, or was I just being paranoid? Rain continued to patter against the windows, and even with my desk lamp on, shadows seemed to coalesce in the corners, stretching along the laminated floor. Another creak, and the shuffle of movement. It was definitely coming from inside the closet. There was something in there. I rose from my desk, swallowing back the lump in my throat. With trembling hands, I yanked open the closet doors and promptly screamed as a pale face stared back at me from the darkness, eyes wide and lips stretched into an unruly grin. It took a moment for me to gather myself before exploding in a fury. April, what the hell do you think you're doing? The girl cocked her head with a sly smile a strand of red hair drifting over her eyes. I didn't think you'd find me. What are you talking about? We're not playing hide and seek, I said incredulously. April simply giggled under her breath, stepping out of the closet. She was holding her hands behind her back, and I frowned. Was she hiding something? Seriously, what were you doing in there? You scared me, I said, shaking my head. God, what was the matter with this girl? April shrugged, sidestepping around me. One order takeaway? I'm starving. Um, no thanks, I muttered. With a shrug, she disappeared out of my room without letting me see her hands. But I thought I glimpsed something metallic in the reflection of my table lamp. With a sigh, I closed my bedroom door, wishing more than ever that I had a lock on it. That night wasn't good. I was woken up by voices. At first I thought I was dreaming, but... Even after I'd shaken myself awake and sat up in bed, I could still hear it. Frantic whispering coming from right outside my door. The air was chilled as I climbed out of bed, pulling on a robe as I padded towards the door. It sounded like multiple voices at first, but when I pressed my ear to the wood, I realized that there was only one. A single female whisper. April. Gritting my teeth in anger, I grasped the handle and threw open the door, stepping out into the darkened hallway. The landing was empty, but when I lifted my gaze, I glimpsed a shadow disappearing around the corner, the creeping of footsteps moving further away. What was she doing wandering around the flat at this time of night? I closed the door behind me and climbed back into bed. As long as she didn't disturb me, I was happy to leave her to her strange wanderings. I managed to drift off but it wasn't long before my eyes fluttered open once again. It was still the dead of night, but something had woken me. The rain had finally stopped, and the silence was strangely forbidding, like it was trembling with a held breath. I turned over onto my side and recoiled with a scream. Someone was standing beside my bed. Fumbling backwards, I reached for the lamp beside my bed and switched it on, harsh yellow light filling the room. April was standing next to my bed, staring down at me with a crazed look in her eyes. In her hand, she was clutching a steak knife, the one we normally kept in the kitchen drawer. April! Jesus Christ, what are you doing? The girl didn't respond. She merely stared at me with a crooked smile on her lips. A strange shadow in her eyes that made her look like a stranger. April, seriously, I said, a tremble in my voice. If you don't knock this off, I'm calling the police. 
She lifted her head then, blinking as though coming out of a daze, and started to laugh. It was a laugh that could only be described as guttural, like something was being torn out of her chest. She threw her head back and gurgled out a laughter until she couldn't breathe. Then, she turned and walked straight out of my room, twirling the knife between her fingers. I ended up moving out. I could no longer deal with April or her volatile moods. Standing in my room with a knife was the last straw for me. I no longer felt safe around her. I'm glad I got out when I did, because her next flatmate, the one who replaced me, wasn't so lucky. My name is John and I'm 29 years old. Last year I got married and my wife Lena and I decided to spend our honeymoon in Ireland. We were absolutely convinced, seeing pictures and videos of its natural beauty. A quiet island. It would be the perfect place for our first romantic chapter as a married couple. Plus, Lena, being fascinated by Celtic mythology since she was young, only added to the enthusiasm. It was late September. We booked a room in a small and rustic hotel in Dublin. This place is beautiful, Lena said as she opened our bedroom's window, which led to a small balcony. You mean the hotel or the country? I mean both. This view is wonderful. Let's have something to eat and maybe then we'll go for a walk. It's still early. Lena proposed, excited. I'm in, I answered, hugging Lena. We went to a restaurant nearby. It was only 2 p.m. Then it was time to explore the surroundings. After a long walk, we were relatively far from the center of Dublin and into the heart of rural areas. Ooh, John, look at this cemetery. It's so pretty, Lena said, as we discovered what was, indeed, a very interesting graveyard. It was pretty much like a vast garden in which the graves and memorial stones and statues were surrounded by trees and benches. Meanwhile, it was already late in the afternoon and becoming dark. Besides me and Lena, there was no one else in the cemetery. Captured by the mysticism of the place and by the moment, me and my wife made love right next to a Celtic cross. It was quick, but passionate and definitely memorable. Before we left, we looked at the name carved on the grave below the Celtic cross. Out of respect, believe it or not, human emotions can be so strange, I know. It was a woman named Iris O'Brien. I remember that I also noticed the year of her death, 1928. But I didn't see the year of her birth. Well, in any case, half excited, half embarrassed, but definitely happy. Me and Lena decided to go to a good and genuine Irish bar and have a nice whiskey. Eventually, we went back to our hotel room, and by that time it was already 1 a.m. Our first day in Ireland was perfect, and I hoped for the rest of our honeymoon that it would be this good. The next morning when I woke up, Lena wasn't there, but... She left me a note saying, Don't be worried. I went to the graveyard again to pay my respects to Iris. I know this sounds silly, but I wanted to say a little prayer. Don't sleep too long. Love, Lena. Not being a religious or superstitious man myself, I still thought that it was nice of Lena. I thought it was a really sweet idea, but might as well play it safe, right? I had breakfast, which was part of the hotel service, and decided to go meet Lena after. Maybe she was still at the cemetery. I didn't want to bother her, so I didn't call her. Taking the same route, I reached the cemetery. And there she was, sitting on Iris' tomb. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Did you say a prayer? I asked. Lena didn't answer. She just stared at me, with an introspective and cautious look in her eyes. Hey, are you all right, Lena? After a couple of seconds, she finally smiled and said, Yeah, I'm all right. I'm just hungry. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's just go to the restaurant down the road uh, and we'll get a nice snack. 
I had breakfast about an hour ago, but walking through the fields has opened my appetite again, I answered. Lena held my arm the whole time as we walked to the restaurant, but she didn't say a word. But on the other hand, she was smiling a lot and observing me as if she was curious about me. I thought maybe she was just feeling spiritual or contemplative, so I smiled back. Throughout the rest of the day, Lena became a little more talkative, but she was acting different. Not in an unpleasant manner, though, but her fiery and spontaneous personalities seemed to have been replaced by a somewhat melancholy and shyish behavior. I assumed that the prayer at the cemetery might have had an effect on her. She'll be fine, I thought to myself. As we walked back to our hotel, I noticed something strange. She was wearing a black necklace that I had never seen before. Hey, Lena, where'd you get that necklace? I asked. Oh, this? I bought it. <laughs> you found a store that sells something like that? Well, that's kind of cool. Can you take me there? Maybe they have something cool, like a Viking amulet or something. <laughs> you know Dublin was founded by Vikings, right? I said. I didn't visit a store. I saw an old lady selling necklaces and crosses at the nearby cemetery. I bought it from her, Lena answered. Oh, I see. Uh, well, it's really beautiful, I said, being sincere. The necklace had a triskel, which is also known as a Celtic spiritual symbol. That night, Lena and I made love. At first, my wife appeared very shy, but then, after the first few minutes, she took charge. She started to kiss me passionately and held me strongly. Too passionately and too strongly. She was actually biting my face and carving her nails into my body. And her necklace, which she didn't remove, was making me feel uncomfortable. Lena, stop. What are you doing? You're hurting me, I shouted. But she wouldn't let go and I almost froze when she finally screamed. Stop calling me Lena! I'm Iris. My name is Iris, and you are my man. I returned to this world to have another chance. At first, I, I couldn't tell if Lena was just joking, but then I saw that the Triskel from her necklace was displaying an eerie, shining glow. And suddenly... I heard a whispering voice in my head. It sounded like Lena, the Lena that I knew and loved. It said, remove the necklace from her, destroy it, save me, John. Without thinking twice, I did just that. It wasn't easy, but being a man, I was still stronger and able to do it. I smashed the Triskel. Lena screamed like a banshee and finally returned to her original self. John? I can, I can feel my own body again, she said with tears in her eyes. Lena, what happened? I asked as I hugged my wife. I, I, when I went to Iris's tombstone, the, there was this necklace on top of it. it. It was so beautiful and irresistible as if it wanted me to wear it. I couldn't resist and put the necklace around my neck, and I felt a horrifying sensation. I stopped feeling my own body, although my mind was still there, trapped inside, but not alone. I know it sounds crazy, but I, I think the ghost of Iris took over me. Her spirit, it never left the cemetery. She died too young and wanted to experience more in this world. I think I could capture that from her thoughts, but I guess we gave her that opportunity. Lena started explaining. Well, I'm just glad it's over, hopefully. Lena, let's get out of here. I agree, my wife replied. And this was my honeymoon in Ireland. I hope Iris finds her peace and crosses over. As for me and my wife, 
who never underestimate cemeteries ever again. I left my parents' house earlier than most teenagers did. At 17, I was ready to live alone, and though it was hard at the beginning, I valued my privacy more and continued searching for a greener pasture until I clocked 24 and got a good job where I could afford to live in a sane neighborhood. Coupled with the tough times I went through, I had also lived in the most sinister areas in town and inhabited spaces with gangsters, rapists, and murderers to pass the night. So it was imminent that I was always on alert to the attributes of vile neighbors. A few months into my stay in this modern and new apartment, a new neighbor got the flat next door, which the agent said had been empty for months. During my inspection of the flat, I preferred the flat that had just been purchased, but the master bedroom had tall trees by the window that casted spooky shadows in the night. It was a red flag for me, as I settled for the apartment I was now staying in. Hello? I heard a knock on my door on a weekend that I'd planned to rest throughout, but that wasn't all. I wasn't expecting anyone, and I had no friends in the neighborhood, so I suspiciously checked the keyhole and saw a man grinning widely in home clothes. His eyes were fixed on the keyhole like he expected me to check, which irritated me. It's your new neighbor. He identified himself and further disgusted me. Oh, wow. I faked a smile and turned the doorknob for him to come in. His shoulders were broad, and his blue eye pierced into my body with his sexy beard that seemed to beckon on my whole existence. I deduced that the view I saw from the keyhole was what gave birth to the anger within me, but immediately he stepped in, and my anger subsided, and his cologne chilled my nostrils. You're welcome. I'm new here, and I need friends, so I thought I'd come on over to bond with you, he chuckled as he walked to the dining table, leaving me behind to follow his steps. I moved in on Wednesday, but realized you were never home. I guess you'd be around today, and ta-da! He opened his alluring hands widely like he wanted to hug me, but I could tell he was motioning a surprise gesture. Yeah, I work around the clock in a law firm, so I only get less busy on weekends, hence my compulsory absence, I chided. What's your name? I asked quickly before he did. Nevada. Nevada Wedlock, he stated. I'm Phoebe. I reposted to hook the conversation on the cliff of communication. Nice name, and I guess we're acquaintances now. He chuckled. He was feeling too familiar with the house and suspicious, but I had a double standard on this opinion, and viewers like it, he was creating some sort of bond with being his familiar. So do you live alone? Yeah. Single and maybe not searching, I laughed. And he did too, but I could see a ring on his ring finger, which symbolized that he was either married or engaged. Maybe, he emphasized. Yes, I'm not in a rush for something serious, but if it comes by, I'm not afraid. I answered loudly, so I didn't have to say it twice. That's a smart decision there, he laughed. We're in the same shoe, he said and I sincerely saw him cover his ring finger immediately. Oh, really? You aren't married? I asked. Just like you, he teased, and I laughed to ease the tension in the room. We continued our conversation around marriage and love until I couldn't control the sleep in my eyes and asked to see him on Sunday after church. He walked out and helped himself open the door without waiting for my assistance. That was where I'd begun to realize the reality of his familiarity with the house. I dawdled to my room to sleep that afternoon until evening, when I woke to the thud of someone on the roof. I tried to go back to sleep, but couldn't, and decided to stroll around the neighborhood to the park nearby. I walked in with my sunshades on and scanned the entirety of the park till I found a spot to sit and clear my head. After a while, I got disgusted and was about to leave, when I saw Nevada walk into the park with a tan skin lady in white clothes and brown hair. I was at the far west of the park, and my shades were certain to keep me disguised, so I watched how they joked around with keen interest in each other, and summed up my whole research with the fact that he was lying about not being engaged or married. I found it funny, and left the park without delay before he saw me. I was about to sleep later that night, when I received a call from an unknown number. 
And as expected, it was Nevada. Hello, neighbor, he said cheerfully. But even though I found him attractive, I didn't find it comfortable receiving a call from him in the middle of the night, especially when he just lied about his relationship status. Nevada, I answered. What are you doing? He asked. Sleeping, I reposted angrily. True, he answered quickly, laughed, and paused. What do you mean by true? I looked at the window to check if I was being spied on, but no one was there. Nothing. I mean, you should be asleep. He laughed and ended the call abruptly. It was enough to think about, but my eyelids had become so heavy to carry, so I didn't ponder about it and slept off. The next day was brief and ended with a knock on my door at around seven. It was Nevada. Hope I'm not too late or early, he said as I opened the door, catching a glimpse of an injury near his left eye. He didn't wait for an answer as he paced to the living room and threw himself on the couch. Too forward, I whispered, as I joined him in my living room where he looked relaxed and calm. I'm sorry I disturbed you last night, he said eventually. I didn't think about it. I tried to let bygones be bygones when he interrupted. No wonder you slept well, he concluded my statement. But before I could object to the certainty of his statement, the news on TV caught my attention. A girl was found dead at Daenerys East Coast Park yesterday night. She's been identified as Jesse Parker. I turned to see the TV, and what my brain interpreted as the person on the screen was the girl that I'd seen with Nevada at the park. I turned to him and saw a knife in his hands and his trousers unzipped. I quickly tried to run, but he was swift enough to catch me and wrap me in his arms as he overpowered me and tried to undress me. Immediately, he let me free a little to take off my pants. I jabbed his groin and bolted out of his arms and watched him plunge to the floor in pain. His reality was before me as I heard him whisper, No one will save you. I've locked the doors from the outside. How'd you know where my key is? I tried to open the door, but it was truly locked from outside. I have a camera in every room in your <laughs> He laughed. Our house! <laughs> Angrily, I closed the gap between us as he rose to his feet. I jabbed his stomach with my knee, knocking him unconscious on my living room rug. It was far from over, but I made sure he wasn't my problem anymore when I called the police on him.